Good morning. Happy New Year and welcome to worship at Brentwood Baptist Church. My name is Brian. I get to serve uh, this church on staff. I'm so glad you've chosen to be here to begin the new year well and coming to God's house and worshiping him. Before we get fully engaged in our worship service, I want to tell you about a few things to help us fulfill our mission as a church, connect people to Jesus Christ through worship, discipleship, and service. To begin, if you're a parent of either a fourth or fifth grader or a student, seventh or twelfth grade, two quick things. One is, one of the things we pride ourselves in is teaching uh, all of our children the Bible. And we try to do it in a way that's interactive so they have experiential opportunities. And Marketplace has long served that need. And that continues to serve for kindergarten through third grade. But beginning next week, our fourth and fifth graders will enjoy a special worship experience that's part of the Marketplace ministry. And so that's new. So if you have a fourth or fifth grader next week uh, during the worship opportunity, you can read about it in your bulletin. You would want them to plug in. And then girls uh, for 7th through 12th grade, we have our, our snowball retreat coming up. Uh, they'll get d heavy into scripture and worship together. So that is a great opportunity and deadlines are coming up for both of those. The holidays are a great time for lots of people and lots of reasons. But one of the difficult things is, is grief and also in dealing with things that have gone uh, not so great in the past. One of those is divorce care. And our congregational care ministry has decided we want to walk alongside those who are struggling with the ramifications of divorce. And so if uh, you've been through that either recently or years past and you're still struggling with that, we have a divorce care is a biblical approach to dealing with how to get through that. So we had that for the adults. And if you had children that were impacted by a divorce, we have divorce care for kids. Both those are listed in the bulletin, all the details there. They start very soon in January. So if you've been through that, take advantage of that opportunity. Our uh, worshiping arts center, the Brentwood uh, Worshiping Arts Center, BWAC, is beginning lessons for the spring semester starting very soon. Uh, 14 weeks of lessons in voice, in instrument, and even in art. And so whether you're an adult or a child, there are opportunities for you. You can get all those details online. But if God's gifted you in those ways, and you've maybe put it on the shelf for a while and hadn't been using it, maybe you should consider getting some lessons, refreshing yourself, so then you can give that gift back to God. Next Sunday is a uh, must-attend Sunday. It's our annual Vision Sunday. Senior Pastor Mike Glenn, he'll join us here. And we'll simulcast this sermon, not just on the internet, but to all of our campuses. So all the five campuses, we'll hear from Mike next week. As Mike talks about the next steps uh, for our church and what that means for Brentwood Baptist Church. And so you'll want to be here. Mike's taking his time off to, to deal with that and be prepared for that. And uh, I look forward to hearing from him. And I hope you'll plan to be here as well. One last thing, if you're a guest, uh, maybe your uh, resolution was to begin attending church more regularly. And if that's the case, we're glad you're here. We're glad that you've given this opportunity to God and to us. There's a communication card in the bulletin, and it simply acts this way. If you would just simply trust us with some information, uh, we'll waste to contact you. We'll prove trustworthy, but we will contact you. We won't sell your information. We just want to contact you, follow up, make sure you have enough information about our church. So if that's something of interest, fill it out. You can drop in the offering plate uh, as that passes as your gift to this church later in the service. Now as a gift to others, would you stand up, welcome them uh, to worship and say Happy New Year to those around you. I'll point at you. Well, I want to add my word of greeting to you as well. We've gathered in God's house to worship Him and to give Him our praise today. We begin with this song, this scripture, 1 Chronicles 29, 13. Would you read it with me? Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Let's join our hearts together and worship the Lord. Let's sing. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our saints, to fall on your grave. Sing it. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together. Your name, to call on our name, to fall on your grave. 
read this with me from 1st John chapter 1 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin what a great hymn of testimony today let's join our voices great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ.
saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. John chapter 14, verse 6. Would you read this with me? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is our declaration today. Join your voice to the song. In this time of desperation When all we know is that There is only one foundation we believe, we believe in this world.
not an act of religion. It's not a check mark in our list of things to do. It's a conviction that goes all the way to our souls. We're here today because we believe He is who He said He is. He'll do what He said He will do. He's never broken a promise. Why would we ever expect that He would break one now? That's why we gather to worship. One of those great promises is that when we call on Him, He hears us. And that's why this part of our worship time is a time of very important personal reflection when we bow our hearts and our heads and we pray. We're delighted to have Bill Wilson Jr. preaching here today. And in a few moments, he'll take this podium and open God's Word. He'll be here at these steps. And there will be those of you that will want to come pray for him as he prepares in just a few moments to bring God's Word. But these steps and this altar is open to anyone that would like to come. Are just where you are, just calming our hearts and responding to the Lord for all He's done for us. Let's be seated as we begin to pray together. The declaration is on our lips. We believe. And Lord, we want to respond to you today because of that belief with worship and with surrender and sacrifice, obedience. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts as your servant comes to bring your word to us today. And help us to hear and to respond again with belief, faith, and conviction. We thank you, Lord, for your promise that you will come again and for your further promise that you would never leave us nor forsake us in the meantime. So in these moments, we thank you for being so close, so present in our lives. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, and this is a, I can think of no better way than to start the new year off then with a baptism in our service this morning and so this morning we have luke jones luke and i talked about three or four weeks ago uh, up in the children's area and just sat down around the table and he talked about how this is a decision he's made a while back he made it at home with his family and he wanted to let everybody know that hey this is where where he's at um, i got an email from his mom just yesterday and she talked about how excited he was this morning i saw him first thing he had a grin from ear to ear and he said i didn't sleep all night so he is so excited about today, and we're excited for him. And I know his parents, Mark and Tara, are excited. And uh, so we just want to celebrate today what, Luke, what God has done in Luke's life. Luke, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Awesome. Well, Luke, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very the likeness of his death. Praise the Lord. Several months ago, I began working with you to think about the Middle Tennessee Initiative. It's been a remarkable year, really. Uh, the idea that we would go from two campuses to five in such a short period of time and begin to fully implement this vision, this dream that at first was just words on a page um, has been remarkable. Uh, actually, the vision got ahead of the structure. It has taken a while to get all of that organized, and I think in 2016 we're going to see truly amazing things happen, not just 
in and around the campuses of Brentwood Baptist, but in Middle Tennessee. I think we're going to begin to see a, a kind of renewal and a revival, if you will, of spirit and faith. And this congregation, quite honestly, has the potential to do something that very few churches would ever dream to do. That is to give yourself away for the kingdom and to bring God's kingdom here to Middle Tennessee as it is in heaven. It's a bold and ambitious dream. Next week, Mike will talk about it a bit more. And as you prepare for that and as you prepare for worship today, we want to invite you to, again, remember the next campaign, to understand that these funds that we give in the support of our church have an impact not just for us, but for all of our community. Not many churches can say that and actually mean it, but we can and we do. So as we come to this time of prayer, would you commit with me that this year will be a time where we begin to even more so give ourselves fully to this vision and dream of God that has been placed upon our hearts. Would you pray with me as we prepare for this offering? God, you have brought us from so far to this moment. Some of us remember the beginnings, and we recognize that this is a grace gift from you. And we dare to dream that this gift might be multiplied many times over for those who have not yet come to be a part of your kingdom. We pray you would use us as your hands and your feet, your voice, your eyes, your ears, and make of us something we can only imagine on this day. That is, the people of God on a mission from God. We give now sacrificially to make that dream come true. In the name of Christ our Savior, amen. Some of you know me, more of you know my mother, <laughs> and a few of you knew my father. You don't know my mother-in-law. <laughs> I'm one of those lucky guys who married into a beautiful, wonderful family. I love my in-laws as much as my parents. My father-in-law, James, died about 12 years ago. But Naomi Broach Rogers turns 88 next Sunday. She's from Murray, Kentucky. She lives about 10 minutes from us in Winston-Salem in a nursing facility. I've been married to her youngest daughter for 39 years and six days. <laughs> Had an anniversary this week. I remembered it. I'm so proud of myself. I'm the father of half of her grandchildren and five and soon to be six of her great-grandchildren. So, I've been knowing Naomi for 40 years, but she doesn't know me. When I walk in the room, she looks at me with a blank stare and says, well, hello, how are you? How's your family? And about 10 seconds later, she says, again, how's your family? And about 12 seconds later, she says it again. How's your family? She doesn't know me. But she should know me. But dementia has taken her memory from her. Now, I'm curious, how many people in this room have a loved one who is or has been a victim of this insidious disease, dementia or Alzheimer's. Just raise your hand. Look around the room. It's amazing. It's one of the great maladies of our day. When the neurological functions cease and memories go away. 
Well, we use a word when we talk about Naomi often, we'll say, she just, she seems lost, you know? She looks lost. And plenty of days she says something to Kathy, my wife, like, why, why am I here? Where am I? When do I get to go home? And who are you? She's lost. And when you lose your memory, you lose that thing about you that is unique and distinct to you. And a person without their memories is lost. There are plenty of us who we think we're unique and distinct with what we wear or what we drive or where we live, but somebody else has all of those things. No one else has your memories. And when you lose your memories, you lose you. You're lost. Now, one of the tough things about dementia is you don't have a choice. It just happens to you, doesn't it? Some of you know that. You came this morning from Mike and I talk about this with his mom and with our family members and friends. And, but there is another kind of memory loss that the Bible often speaks about that is not so much something we're a victim of, it's something that we actually engage in. It's willful forgetting. Or it's selective ignorance or whatever you want to call it. It's when you choose not to remember or you choose to remember something that's really not true. You know the, the drill, you, you over-remember or you under-remember your past. You begin to enhance your, your history, your story. I wasn't just on the team in high school, <clears throat> I was pretty good. In fact, I was a star. Never mind that the records show that I caught four passes in three years at Franklin High School. <laughs> I remember it being an all-star performance. I don't know. You know, we begin to build ourselves up. Our memories, we over-remember some things or we, we under-remember some things. We, it wasn't that bad. Oh, yes, it was. You were a scoundrel. This idea of being selective in our memory is, uh, is a very corrosive thing for God's people. Because as God's people, there's a great temptation, we'll read about it in a moment, for us to forget things we must remember or to misremember things that just didn't happen or didn't happen the way we remember them. Now, we come from a long line of forefathers and mothers who were masters at selective memory. In a moment, we're going to read about how God sees that action and what He might have to say to us about it. Would you stand with me as we look into the, the text? It's the book of Deuteronomy. It's a bit of a lengthy text, but it's worth reading if for no other reason than as we stand on the threshold of this year to remind us to remember, to remember. You must carefully follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. They're on the edge of going into the promised land after 40 years of wandering. Verse 2, remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness, so that He might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would actually keep His commandments. They had gotten to Ten Commandments three chapters earlier. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep His command, the ordinances and statutes that I'm giving you today. And when you eat and are full, and you build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and your 401k, and your... When it's had a great year, which it's going to have this year, right? Because it didn't have last year. But when all of these wonderful things happen, and everything else you have increases, be careful 
that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint-like rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to humble and test you so that in the end He might cause you to prosper. You may say to yourself, Oh, my power, my ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods to worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will perish. Like the nations the Lord is about to destroy before you, you will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. May God bless to our hearing and our understanding these words from His Word. You may be seated. So this memory issue, can we call it spiritual dementia? Can we call it a kind of erosion of memory for God's people, of forgetting what really matters. It is kind of remarkable, isn't it, that sort of the more God's people have, the more likely they are to be forgetful. Haven't you found that to be true in your life? That the more you accumulate the more you forget those hard days. Remember when you didn't have money to go out to eat, so you had breakfast three times a day (laughs) because eggs were cheap? Isn't it remarkable in American culture that the more money people have, the less generous they are? Do you know that? That poor people are much more likely to be generous than wealthy people. 44% more likely, one study shows. Isn't it remarkable that the more we have, the more we want, and the more likely we are to forget how we got it? It's always been true, the less grateful we become. And far too often our prosperity lures us away from God. I love uh, the the passage from C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters where he's describing this phenomena. He said, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really the world is finding its place in him. Oh no, that's it. See, once we begin to forget God and allow that to take root, the myth of self-sufficiency, we begin to believe that we've done all this ourselves. Did you hear it in verses 17 and 18? When you're tempted to think, look at what we did. Look at this church. Look at this. It's amazing. Look at what we did. Isn't this something? Isn't it remarkable? Look at you. Look at what you've done. Look at where you live. Look at all the things you... Aren't you something? Aren't we something? The warning is clear. When you begin to forget how you got here, be careful. Israel, you will fail. You will fall. There's no sugarcoating verses 19 and 20. We tend to begin to believe our own press clippings, like the old little fly in Aesop's fable. Remember that one? The little fly is riding on the back of a chariot. And looks behind at the great cloud of dust and says, My, what a great cloud of dust I'm causing. Ah, that's us. We forget. Spiritual amnesia, spiritual dementia, willful forgetting of how we got here and why we're here. This deficient memory and resulting self-absorption 
quite honestly leads to a sense of privilege and entitlement. I see it too often in congregations, I have to tell you. Worked last year with 50 congregations around the country, our group, and what I see all too often is congregations that have begun to think that church is about me, <laughs> about us, right? So we come and we pay a little money and we want to get what we get. It's the consumer mentality come to church. We actually begin to think that the church is here to serve me. And so I have a right to say, I, I want this kind of music, and I want this kind of air conditioning, certain temperature, right, thermostat wars in every church. And I want this kind of food on Wednesday nights, or I want this kind of teaching, or I want this, I want, the, I expect, right, you know this feeling? And I have to tell you, after pastoring 36 years, and now spending a few years in the pew occasionally, I have to fight this urge to sit back and go, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I think I would have said, I wish they had done, I, I really would have preferred. It's, it's this notion of forgetting why we're here and substituting some consumer mentality for it. Now, th this amnesia, this inability to remember is incredibly toxic. We have to fight it. We have to remember to remember. Now next week, Mike is going to talk about the future, but I want to set him up for that by talking about the past today and about today and about preparation for this year. We're on the, the three days into a year, and there's no telling what God's going to unfold in your life and mine and collectively in the church's life. But as we prepare for all of that, let, let me drive you back to your memories while you still got them. And use this text to remind us what it is we are called to remember. Now, remember that God, God has been at this memory thing for a long time. He knew that His people would be forgetful. Sometimes willfully, sometimes just sloppily. But that we would tend to forget who we are, and why we're here. And early on, in fact, in Deuteronomy 6, the great commandment, you'll love God, Lord, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to teach this to your children, and you're coming, and you're going, and you're walking, talking. Bind them to your forearms, he says, and put them on your forehead. And today, you can still see Orthodox Jews who wear what's called a phylactery when they pray. You'll see one on the screen in a moment. A phylactery is a, a, a bound forearm. There's a little box in his palm and on his, on his bicep, and there's a box on his forehead. And the phylactery is a box that contains six different scriptures. And the intent is kind of like the rubber band on the wrist. You know, remember, remember who you are. Remember how you got here. When you pray, remember. You're not... You're not praying for more stuff. You're praying to be humbled. You'll see the next slide is a person at the wailing wall praying with the phylactery, with the little box of Scripture text. Now, we're not going to ask you to wear one of these out of the sanctuary today. I'm not sure we get many takers. And Jesus had something to say about people who were more form than substance. They let this become the object of their worship. But God knew early on Deuteronomy 6, that his people would tend to forget the important things and be distracted by their own success. I think that might have something to say to us. Well, in this text, I believe there are some things that you and I need to remember this year. And as you get ready for next week, and as you get ready for the other 362 days of this year, could I ask you to remember some things? First, would you try your best to remember how you got here? Verse 2 says, Remember that the Lord your God led you on this entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that He might humble you and test you to know that what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commandments. 
That begins a litany of verses there where there's a pretty stern tone about don't forget. (laughs) Kind of like my dad said to me when I went off to college, Bill, don't forget who you are. I really hated it when he said that. Didn't you? Did you ever have someone tell you that? Don't forget who you are. The intent being, don't forget how you got here. Now, some of you have walked a, a long and winding road to get to this moment, this day, and this room. And you're pretty familiar with humility. Some of you have made lots of wrong turns along the way. And by the grace of God, you're in this room today remembering how God has blessed you and been gracious to you and merciful to you. Others, you haven't done that yet. Now, some of us are like the guy who woke up on third and thought he hit a triple. You know, you just kind of woke up in life and everything's kind of going your way and you think, hey, this is, this is pretty good by me. This is me doing this. And many churches are like that. Look around us. We, we, we're doing pretty good, right? Things are going well. Remember how you got here. Remember whose shoulders you stand on. Because you stand on someone's. Remember all the people who went before you to make this very moment possible for you. Remember the people who prayed for you when you you needed that prayer. Remember the people who loved you when you were quite unlovable. Remember all the folks who poured their life into your life so that on this day, in this moment, you'd be in this room. Remember how you got here. If I could put a little box on your forehead, one of the things I'd ask you to remember is how you got here. And what it would produce for you, it always does, is humility. It's what he wanted, he said in verse 2. He wants his people to be humble. What offends God more than anything else is pride among his people. He wants humility. And this moment in this week, by the way, the Sabbath experience, this Sunday worship, or whenever you worship, is a critical piece for your ability to remember and be humbled. When you walk in this room, the only appropriate emotion from you is humility. Leave your pride your self-sufficiency, your narcissism at the door. The only appropriate response to the gracious love of God in Jesus Christ is to fall on your knees and say, oh God, have mercy. Lord, have mercy, the earliest Christian prayer. I was in a church in Israel one time, ancient church, like 800 years old sanctuary, in which the only door into the sanctuary or the worship space was a four-foot-tall door. Now, it wasn't because the people who lived in Damascus were short people. Why do they have a low threshold into the sanctuary? So that everyone who came in had to do this. Bow before you enter the presence of God. I'm thinking that would be good. What do you think? Some of you have to crawl in You understand, right? You come into worship, remember where you are. Remember why you're here. You come in and are humbled at the memory of what has transpired to bring you to this moment. The children of Israel were prone to forget this, and so were we. We think this is for us. God is clear. This is not for us. It is for Him. So, first thing I'd ask you to try to remember, remember how you got here and be humble. Second thing I'd invite you to look at this text and find is remember, remember why you're here. You'll find that in verse 11. Uh, Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep His command, the ordinance and statutes I'm giving you today. It's God's Word that feeds us and sustains us. We're not trying to come up with some new vision for the church. We're simply trying to hold up the vision for the church. We don't get to choose it. 
We get to follow His commandments and statutes. We get to follow the things that God has said He wants His people to be about. And all through this text, he refers back to an event that took place in Genesis 12 when he came to Abraham and said, hey, Abram, let's go. I want to take you on a trip to a land you don't know, to people that are not yours. And I'm going to bless you, and through you will be a blessing to all nations. Remember that? Now, many times we think it stops with, I'm going to bless you. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be great. God's going to bless us. Uh, the, The intent from the beginning was, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to all nations. The mission of God's people has never wavered one iota from that day. Jesus picked up on it in in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission. Go into all the world, make disciples, go into all the world, all the nations, all the people. I'm giving you this amazing gift of the Spirit and of resurrection life and new life, and abundant life, not so you can come to Brentwood Baptist and hang out with people who look like you and talk like you and just be a little club for Jesus on Concord Road. you got enough of those. I'm doing this so you can go and make disciples. That's why we're here. We don't get to pick the mission. The mission has been given us from Genesis 12 and repeated multiple times across the text all the way to Matthew 28. And if you don't like that mission, take it up with Abraham and Jesus. We didn't make it up. It's the one we were given. We are on a mission, if we remember it, why we're here to make disciples, to be a blessing to all people, to all of the city, to all of Middle Tennessee and beyond. It is not come and let us entertain you, though you do incredible things here. It's let us inspire you. Let's encourage one another to good works, to to the work of the kingdom, to bring the kingdom to Brentwood, Franklin, Middle Tennessee, as it is in heaven. We pray it, and God means it. So the second thing I'd invite you to remember, first, how did you get here? Secondly, why are you here? Humility first. Now I'm humble because I know I got here through God's grace. Purpose now because I am here not simply to consume and soak up this church, but I'm here to be a servant in the kingdom of God. Third thing the text tells us that we're to remember is remember who's in charge. It's in there, verse 18. It's a reminder that it's God's power that's behind all of this, not yours or mine or Mike's or anybody else's. This is a God thing. Remember that the Lord your God gives you the power. We get the power from God. We don't generate it. We don't have to provide it. We, we simply are vehicles for it. When we give ourselves to this vision and mission and remember why we're here and how we got here and who's in charge It's amazing what happens. It's amazing how God is able to use people who are humbled and not worried about who's getting the credit, about how much this is going to cost, or any of those things, which are legitimate concerns, but pale in comparison to the concern of, are we doing what God has called us to do? Then God's power is unleashed. My guess is, and my prediction would be, we'll stand a year from today saying, can, can you believe some of the things that have happened? When we began to actually believe Jesus was serious when He said, you find your life when you give your life away. What, what if that was true? <laughs> what if it wasn't just rhetoric that you, you, you gain by losing? That you find abundance in your life, not by hoarding, but by giving? Who knew? Oh, we forgot that because that's been his way. You you heard it, right? The more you have, be careful the temptations to think that you did something special. It's all a gift. It's all a gift. It's, It's to reveal the power and might of God. Jesus picked up on the theme of memory. 
He knew that his disciples were like the children of Israel, that they would forget. So that last night in the upper room, he took bread and took the cup, remember? Remember? And he broke it. And he said to them, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, I want you to do so in remembrance of me. And in many churches, you'll see a table, like you'll see on the slide in a moment. You know that, you know that table? It's called a communion table or Lord's Supper table. And almost always engraved in the front of it are these words. Did you grow up in a church with, in remembrance of me on the front table? Oh, yeah. It's a weekly reminder that we do all of this in remembrance of him. He knew we would forget. He knew we'd think this was about us. <laughs> this is about making us happy. He knew we'd get confused because the children of Israel got confused and the disciples got confused, and so would we, and so we must remember. So what if 2016 is predicated the success of this church, the effectiveness of our mission and vision, what if it's all predicated on your ability to remember to remember? What if your life as a Christ follower is basically going to be determined the ability to find the abundant life Christ has for you on your ability to remember how you got here, humility, why you're here, some purpose in your life, and who's in charge, some power in your life. What if you could remember those three things this year? There's really not much hope for my mother-in-law. She's a sweetheart. Love her to death. But there is hope for your memory issues. It's a choice. And it's in there, isn't it? You, you remember. Remember? The day before yesterday, we had our five grandchildren go see Naomi. Our five grandchildren, Catherine, Liam, Margaret, Virginia, Zoe, six, five, four, four, and two. It's a lovely, exciting household this week. We want them to know Naomi. She won't be with us much longer. But we want them to know their great-grandmother. And so they came in, and it was chaos. You can imagine. And several times Naomi leaned over to Kathy and said, now who are these people? We don't know. They just follow. Oh, who is she? Who are they? Who are you? <laughs> Why are we here? And it was, it was a bit confusing. And, and then in the background I was playing some music. These little preschoolers are songbirds. They have been singing. I, they've been at our house for 10 days. They left yesterday. I still can remember all the words to all the songs they were singing. And in the background began to play Away in a Manger. And Catherine began to sing, and the other kids began to sing, away in a manger. And Naomi, you know, she began to sing. And the six of them sang this beautiful version. I'm still not over it. Watch them sing, away in a manger. We knew all the verses, by the way. And it was a moment of remembering. It was in there. She could remember. She didn't know who these people were, but she knew that tune. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. What if that's, that's what heaven's going to be like? When we finally remember the words to the songs, the scripture. The reason we're here, not just to accumulate, but to be God's people on a mission. What if that memory starts today? What if this is the year to remember? 
in so many ways for Brentwood Baptist. What if this is the year to remember in your life? It will only happen if you remember to remember. Humility, purpose, power. Let's pray together. God, it is so easy to forget. It is so tempting to relegate you and all of our memories. Forget them. To strike out on our own. I pray for people in this room today who have forgotten why they're here. That they might remember today like never before why God created them, the mission God has given them. I pray for this great church that we would remember why we're here and how you've blessed us to be a blessing to others and to make disciples in your name. Awaken within us the memories, those songs and those texts, the reason for being. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We will remember all that he has done. Sing with me. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hand. And we will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. Let's sing it again. We will remember, sing it. We will remember, we will remember. We have friends waiting to speak with you. If you'd like someone to share with you after the service, they're right back here in the parlor. Thank you all for worshiping with us today. God bless you as you go.